Hello everyone, today we talk about Mamluk military engineering and more in particular of the Midfa handgun. One of the uh, first examples of firearms to court and handguns at the same time in, in medieval history, which unavoidably will open to a bit of considerations also to the spread of gunpowder and the development of its uh, military technology that is um, actually far from, from being a, a completely um, understood uh, dynamic in, in as much as it encompassed many uh, regions of Eurasia at the same time uh, with different results and effects, different levels of documentation and properly also different uh, military needs, which doesn't mean necessarily that where the thing was developed the first eventually would develop uh, the most, uh, but also that we, uh, I think, have to think more more fluidly, more flexibly than when, when what we're used to, right? This is not a race to, again, to, to did the thing first, but rather uh, a puzzle, right? It is very difficult to recompose, properly measure uh, all the various historical uh, milieu and realizing why and how you know we can't get some information from this with terms uh, such as the one of midfights uh, itself that are also not uh, linear are not uh, categorical in a scientific sense in medieval sources this is normality we made videos about uh, chiefly about gunpowder uh, arms uh, let's say medieval times never quite dedicated to handguns etc we start a bit today with, with this one so the mm, the thing start this is supposed to be a, a troop type video right and this Mamluk engineer with Midfa is um, let's say a, a type uh, that is described and illustrated by Al Hassan Al Rahman was um, essentially a, a Mamluk chemist and engineer um, in a work dated to roughly the 80s or the 90s of the 13th century, so it's very early in time, that's why it's so important to start from there, um, documenting, in fact, a lot of uh, fire weapons, that, uh, of which the Midfa was, was just one. Right. And as far as we understand from the uh, illumination, here I literally reproduced by hand the thing from the, from the illumination, it's identical, right? I, I simply copied the, the, uh, the, out, the, the silhouette and it's uh, literally the same. And uh, as, you, as it's understandable, it's, it's, it's an early firearm, right? The, the bullet top should be basically the bullet uh, or uh, put, let's say, in, in the muzzle. Uh, here, the, the, the illumination renders it differently, but that, that would be the, the idea, right? This is a, essentially a, uh, um, made, of, made of wood, actually, because we will see that even, I don't know, in China, etc., the early, uh, uh, say, barrels were made of things like bamboos, etc., so with a barrel only as deep as its muzzle width, by the way, so uh, you understand what could be the the performance of these early firearms, but always remember that doesn't matter how strange. There is a bit of technologistic prejudices. Lots of people I discover laugh at these early firearms because they say, "Ah, you know, they are useless." Well, if they were there, they weren't useless, right? We can um, speculate on, especially on, on this specific image, whether it was actually a prototype, whether it was actually used and that early um, you know, on the field but wh whenever we see uh, uh, you know uh, clearly a, uh, a depiction of, a, of these arms in combat and we know they were used and documented by by other sources we know that if they were there they were useful in a way or another so uh, always remember that technology is nothing doctrine is everything so uh, we have to understand how they were used collectively because that's what at the end of the day makes the world think. So at this point we made a video, for example, about uh, the long sunset of trebuchet warfare that explains the gradual integration of firearms next to torsion or counterweight um, catapults, essentially. And um, so it, it, the, the world thing went on really slowly. So now we are very concerned about this for broader technological interests, the history of science, etc. But we have to make an effort as military historians to understand what was the deal 
right? And today we will maybe stick more to the, the problem in general, what, how we can document whether something was employed and how in the first place um, in, in a given time and, 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 and region and area, let's say. But uh, at some point we will make videos properly how, you know, early firearms were used. Uh, tactically speaking, some of this too as well, but say mixed mostly with the here the the ground powder mixture that was used properly to create uh, bombs. Right, the, the idea is that um, essentially as soon as gunpowder was um, you know employed for military purpose, that there were grenades around, uh, and um, that's basically it. Next to properly firearms in terms of you know shooting uh, barrels, per se. But, um, so what we get from, generally speaking, as we will see now, how the thing worked was uh, loaded with, uh, this bunduk was uh, fundamentally a mixture uh, that would fill a third of the barrel, consisting of ten parts of saltpeter, there was properly the baroud, as we will see now, with it properly understood in a broader sense as, as gunpowder. Uh, two parts charcoal and 1.5 parts sulfur, right, for uh, ignition and so on. The bullets, uh, as they were called, um, bunduks, and we don't understand exactly what they could be, uh, but we can assume they were already spherical, sort of, you know, um, bolts or feathered bolts as well which was also in fact for comparatively as uh, firearms developed around the early you know, European guns used things like uh, arrows to be literally shot from there. And um, as we were saying before, there is a great debate whether discovered gunpowder in, in the first place. And uh, some say it was the, the Chinese, the Indians, the Byzantines, the Arabs, the Germans, the Englishmen, right? And as we were saying before, probably this answer does, uh, it will never be found, and, but the question doesn't, probably it's not a correct one, right? Because we understand that these worlds had uh, a great naturalistic interest and they had prob probably a, a very early uh, knowledge uh, in, in the previous centuries of, of certain um, characteristics of mixtures and so on. The, the, the point is there is also understanding why and how this would be needed, and uh, in Europe, in Europe, it was fundamentally because of, of firearms. Um, the, um, the the the, the, the there, there are lots of myths concerning this, including the fact that in China it would have been used, uh, you know, the, the gunpowder would have been used mostly for uh, a non-military purpose. This is false, actually. It's just that they use a different degree of mixture, and even there, we have to understand why. Uh, I think that the early um, gunpowder, I mean, the, the very fast technological, I mean, yeah, the technological development in firearms in, in Western Europe, by the way, because also in other areas wasn't the same. It, it took a, a long time to, let's say, fill the gap existing with areas like France, Italy, or, uh, but they, this spread fundamentally all over, like Spain, Germany, England, uh, etc. But even in there, why, right? Um, the my opinion is that uh, the the areas were dramatically covered in castles and also of a specific size, right? Not that all the world was covered in castles at that point. The point is that the level of concentration, also the properly the engineering, architectonical uh, developments that were taking place in Western Europe, in feudal Europe, were uh, not to be seen elsewhere. So at that point, you understand that an, an uh, an earlier development of firearms was was needed in that sense. We, we it's like with trebuchet. We don't get news of enormous machines like the ones I don't know used by Edward uh, the 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 first two, but Edward the third as well uh, of England uh, or others uh, in the West as I don't know in in, in Poland or uh, or, or uh, in Russia or other places. Right, at least um, the, it's way less frequent and uh, even in there uh, a technology per se uh, is doesn't indicate anything right in Poland in Russia or whatever they had they knew how to the, the new trebuchets they used them the, the point is why do we have much greater documentation about that 
in other places and why also the mentions of such uh, more widespread and developed use, right? Again, technology is zero. Uh, doctrine is everything. Always remember this, how they were employed and why, right? And and this this is very hard to make people understand. Believe me, I have talked to a lot of very clever people that sometimes probably had a problem. They had to, to say no because technology at the end of the day is, it must be no. It, 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 it's not, right? Technology there is nothing if you, not just if you don't know how to use it, but properly if you don't have a need to have it, right? Because in, in warfare, you can achieve enormous things without technology as well. And I think the history uh, of warfare oh, throughout all eras demonstrates this dramatically. Uh, uh, well, without many needs to, to but again, um, we have always to distinguish the tip of the iceberg from what lays underneath, right? And at that point, that can be important. That is, technology can make the difference at that surface, but if you don't consider the enormous thing that lays be, uh, be, um, underneath, uh, you can't even understand why that technology is there, and you 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 will uh, think that it's all about that tip of the iceberg. It's not, <laughs> right? And what it takes for for that tip of the iceberg to be above um, uh, sea level, right, is an enormous thing underneath, right? That that is political, social, and it and sustains the whole thing. Um, so. Mm, the date of, of the application of gunpowder to a projectile firing weapon is even more hazy for that matter um, and which is counterintuitive if you think about that because in my opinion uh, it's easier in a sense to to spot at least maybe that's my bias as a military historian to to, to spot given that sources chronicles etc speak only about warfare and at a certain point these things start popping out um, in, in, in such an homogeneous way all over the world uh, in terms of military uh, interest let's say that uh, it, it's easier to spot it statistically from there than from uh, who wrote manuals scientific treatises explaining uh, this stuff. There is, there is an important divide naturally between what we see in these texts from which this illumination is taken and from the mil military reality. This is obvious. Consider that as Westerners this technologistic bias comes as from the Greeks, right? That were great minds and were exalted about the uh, the potential, right? The theoretical aspect, right? They, they invented, as you know, this steam engine. They, they, they did a lot of stuff, but the point is that they were content with it, the, of the mental exercise, but eventually certain things were not implemented because why, as we were saying before, there is not the iceberg underneath a sea um, level and uh, other powers like, I don't know, the Romans that were less technologically advanced still, you know, conquered without any problem for that point uh, these areas and also adopted their own technologies and readapted them to, to, and even perfected them uh, in a part in part still the base was fundamentally hellenistic to their own to their own needs uh, but it wasn't that recently um, uh, Kelly de Vries have wrote a, an article which uh, is talking in fact about medieval warfare says that it's titled something like you know uh, catapults are not atomic bombs <laughs> explain I would have never written an article with such a title because I think that at that point that it kind of lowers the uh, the uh, the expectation of the average mindset in the scientific community but as we were saying before this technologistic prejudices are so widespread that um, I mean I believe any person who has studied ancient or medieval warfare actually has an idea of what siege warfare, you know, about what siege warfare concretely served for, right? It, it's, it was just kind of a support system. It, it, they, they didn't solve individually the, the matter. They often needed lots of them. It was all combined with troops. Another thing that is often, you know, not said that, you know, the, the catapults were properly used during the attack, right? Yes, when the soldiers were attacking the walls as well, right? There was... We don't know the details about this, but I studied the matter pretty much in detail for, for the early 14th century, and there are amazing things at some point we'll have to explain, because that shows you how it was for real, right? That you normally don't see in movies or elsewhere, and, and it's fascinating. Uh, not because m movies should ever be seen as something that has even remotely to do with, with realism or accuracy, because they're simply... N completely but totally not about that so you know always watch movies for their artistic quality but 
completely get rid of the problem thinking that that has minimally anything to do with history because that's just you know uh, just out of self-respect towards yourself i would say um the um uh, the the, the important you see w with this myth of um alassane al rama here we uh, we hang we hang on the uh, on essentially a philological codicological paleographical base that is to say when to date this manuscript to right these are questions that not military historians answer and uh, you see this uh, these last decades of the 13th century as we were saying before is a very early time right and if such dating is correct such manuscript is uh, such depiction is certainly amongst the earliest pieces of evidence outside china for uh, properly uh, gunpowder uh, arms right and it, it's really important now this uh, at least the scholars believe that this mitva was nothing more than an experimental device in the mamluk royal arsenal the mamluks had uh, naturally they, 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 their government financed this scientific research egypt was uh, still you know uh, one of the great uh, heirs of the of the, the arab hellenistic knowledge uh, in terms of properly of science and, and if you think about the contrarily to the propaganda that they themselves uh, put on the floor for poli political reasons the muslims once they had occupied byzantine territories had jealously and sacredly treasured all the hellenistic knowledge um but so we know we made videos about also what how scientific development in the west especially through uh, through Toledo, through through Spain, uh, throughout all the Reconquista process, so from from Christian uh, from Muslim to to Christian times, and in fact some of the early um, firearms may have been uh, vaguely uh, documentable in the uh, 1320s of the Emirate of Granada, albeit evidence is inconclusive. Uh, in Western Europe, however, there was already something there. We know that there was a specialized production, at least by the 20s and the 30s, for example, in, in northern Italy, um, uh, central northern Italy. We, we find it pretty much all over the West, right? So uh, we even always, we, we have to distinguish the invention and the application from the intensity of that application on the field. Um, and the... Um, uh, the, the, so this prototype, scholars may think, may have never seen active service, right? But we have info about other technologies that were employed by the Mamluks in, in this context. Um, for example, in um, the, the late 13th century chronicler Ibn Abd al-Zahir remarks that for the siege of al-Markab in 1285, there were, quote, iron implements and flame-throwing tubes issued by the Mamluk royal arsenal. So, once again, these were mm, important mm, uh, weapons that were pro that needed properly a, all a certain statal funding and mm, engineering technical capacity that uh, even if it was prized and that the, uh, the governments paid importantly for. Uh, and uh, this um, uh, idea of nafta tubes, or they're called the ones, for example, at the at Salamit in uh, 1299, that were apparently mounted, by the way, uh, also as the ones uh, that stormed the, the breaches of Acre in 1299, might have been essentially what we uh, we see as the Byzantine siphons. So basically, devices that managed to shoot at some distance uh, liquid fire. Greek fire, how we have called it in, in the West, but that's another prejudice that we have is that, that, that the mixture was somewhat secret. I don't know whether that's a Western bias because in the West um, there was much less development of that specific firearm. For example, the, the Middle East was uh, much more in advance 
of Europe in distillation techniques of petroleum at that time. But uh, it's a myth that only the Byzantines knew what liquid fire was or used them. The Abbasids, the Caliphate, had always used them as well. Uh, after all, the Mesopotamian oil wells are fundamentally the ones where also they got the material. And even if they had had some secret mixer, etc., um, they, you know, it wasn't it wasn't known since antiquity. Also, the Greeks back in the day used Greek fire. They 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 knew it um, since since a long time, right? So uh, another reason why the, there is been a f mythology developed around these topics this day is some literary passages that are once again, especially in the Byzantine world, very much associated with that Hellenic mindset. They wanted to, you know, identify in part the greatness of its own civilization in these devices, right? Um, but the truth being that these were indeed not super weapons, that uh, they, that we have a very vague uh, proof that they were somewhat decisive. Even the, the Arab siege of Constantinople of 717, etc., may have not been decided by that. Right? We don't know. These are all voices from quite un uncritical historiography that just tells the tale, and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I, this, once I met a guy who, who was uh, perplexed by why the Byzantines that uh, had uh, Greek fire in 1453 they didn't manage to keep the Ottomans <laughs> out of the city and aside from the fact that they had it and they employed it and to and failing uh, in it uh, still uh, here you understand properly what the average person's mindset can be about these topics right you you properly Aside from all the fuel, the supply, that you know, the, the performance, the distance, the range, you know, in, in a time where there are, you know, hark abuses in which there are cannons, whatever, and how did this guy was convinced that, you know, by placing the, the, the siphon in front of the breach, you could keep outside, you know, basically all armies in the world convert. And, and well, it, it turns out that, first of all, these weapons were much more common than we think. And secondly, of course, they were much less decisive than we think. Right. Also, because when there is such, uh, you know, uh, parallel use from both sides, you know, the, the effect is nullified. And of course, um, no battle or war has ever been won because, you know, there was one uh, technology that somewhat uh, made the thing and all the rest goes out. First of all, it's humans that fight and must hate each other to tear each other apart. That's really the difference. Uh, before any other material consideration. Um, and also, let's skip other broader, you know, tactical and strategical uh, questions. But always beware, right, of such uh, such attitudes. Now, the Mitfa, uh, on the long run, would also be the name applied to the earliest known Mamluk cannons. And there is a bit of debate of where, when they, they appeared for the first time. Um, it's mostly believed this happened during the, the 1360s, which, which is actually fairly late, because, um, as we've seen, if, if the Mamluks had gunpowder technology and they were implementing it uh, since, you know, one, one, one century, uh, or even before, as we'll see now, uh, you know, there you have the problem of doctrine. And part of this might have been the um, the idea that the Mamluks uh, had of their own, uh, you know, of, of, of themselves, right, or at least properly the, the, the way they fought, already effectively without uh, without that technology, they used to say mostly mounted warfare. Uh, there was a chivalric sense uh, in, among the Mamluks, we've made videos about them also recently, uh, they were Basically, the only Islamic power that developed something similar uh, uh, to the uh, to the to what we call the coat of arms in in, in the West, as sort of proto heraldry, right? Um, and uh, albeit it was kind of a different way because the Iqta system was sensibly different from feudalism, so it was the less ingrained, let's say, aside from all the various uh, totemic symbolism from the steps, etc. And this is. Um, this rejection towards early firearms that would would be considered as dirty and degrading is an attitude that we find many other Turkoman uh, Mongol uh, areas for which we know that there were, as a matter of fact, forces of 
of handgunners uh, among the, the armies of these peoples. For example, the same Mamluks would um, mobilize against the Ottomans a force of African, uh, say, of black Africans, North Africans, and, and Turkomans, a uh, kit like that. Um, at that point, you know, meeting the Ottomans that were dramatically more advanced in, in uh, you know, in, in firearms in, in general. You know how it ended, but even in there, not because of firearms. And the 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 story of the fall of the, Ma of the Mamluk Sultanate is is quite instructive at some levels. Um, but that the same goes for the the Golden Horde, right? You know, properly handgunners were mocked. They they like in the West. In the West, I said that these guys was uh, you know uh, smelled uh, like um, stink like like the like the devil, the soul for all these stuff in. Um, but uh, if this thing served its purpose, as we know, it, 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 it would develop further and become a regular part of, uh, of this world. And it was a cultural trauma, in, in a sense. But even in there, it was much more smoothed and gradual than we think. Um, so the, the Mamluk Sultanate is, uh, is very important, however, for... Um, Properly for a, a ver an early development of uh, gunpowder technology, fire technology in general, as we have seen, uh, there was an Arab term, this Siam Kitaya, which uh, basically means Chinese arrows with uh, naft, right, uh, cartridges uh, attached. So basically, these were rockets that would be launched often in a series, literally, and uh, this stuff came mo mostly via the Mongols that are, you know, were bringing um, a lot of Chinese military te technology to, to, to the West en masse, at, at least. But by the mid-14th century, the Mamluks had a greater variety of fire weapons in, in, in their own arsenal. Consider that by that time, the most advanced uh, for example, naval firearm technology was owned at the time by Venice and Mamluk Egypt, right? They were literally ahead, right? They were pioneering the, the main developments. Um, the uh, original uh, employee of, let's say, of NAFTA, for example, because NAFTA had um, n um, uh, a semantic shift over time. Originally, it, it was really uh, indicating in Arab the... Um, properly the, 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 the distilled petroleum, right? Uh, and therefore they had this pot that they they used uh, as grenades fundamentally today. They could be hand grenades, they could be loaded on trebuchet, right, to set on fire. Uh, think about all the structures within the the stone, uh, the stone uh, f fortresses that were in wood and the majority of the world was made like that. It's possible that in China, the um, the greater amount of sulfur over saltpeter that would make these weapons more towards like kind of fire weapons rather than explosives, but still were were maybe due to the less degree of encastellation as we were saying before the greater presence of I don't know less I don't know wooden defenses things like that this is debatable because also China had a, a dramatic um, let's say uh, in fact. Engineering, military engineering, stone uh, infrastructure, think about the Great Wall and all these things, but within the country, it was very different from Europe in a sense, uh, at least in part. But um, that might have been uh, a reason, and maybe also a less endemic conflictuality from the within at a at a small, you know, uh, at, at a local level, right? Uh, Europe was arguably way more militarized in. In, ter in, in terms of properly per of average inhabitant participation to warfare, in, in a sense. Uh, also, per, per capita wealth was higher, probably in, uh, in many Western European areas, right? It's not surprising that, I don't know, you find, as we were saying before, this early, you know, spread of, you know, all the various uh, Italian city-states. Uh, that, that's another. Um, uh, as you understand, the firearm starts being an asset. Here we can't talk about the so-called military revolution. It was all but a revolution, but that indeed was um, went in parallel with a statal construction because uh, naturally, actually, all powers made use of, of such small, uh, of, of 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 such uh, technologies as we were saying before. But one thing is having an orderly mil uh, artillery part. Another thing is having you know just 
something more scattered and this in fact historically would develop in, in very different ways like I don't know um, Italy or Germany were the most advanced um, this stuff uh, at the end of the Middle Ages but the French would have the best artillery park right and that's quite obvious right you know France was basically almost a modern state extensionally uh, Italy and Germany were all fragmented so uh, and and war was waged in different ways accord in the first place right that's what i would like to to stress um so we've seen also the siphons that properly were as far as we know it would be used in the same way that the byzantines would use it like either literally hand like flame tra hand flame trowers or something larger also mounted on ships with those devices to support the you know the 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 distillation, it's it, the the liquid, etc., that kept burning even on on the sea surface. Something extremely risky, by the way. So that, as you know, was also could find just very limited um, employment, properly because of the sea and wind condition in the situation. So it was it was was a complicated thing uh, to use. Uh, we, we know of piston pumps, ignition uh, fuses on the, nu uh, on the nozzle that we, we know, uh, surely the Mamluks were acquainted with these jets of fire, uh, quote, as long as a, uh, as a lance, right? They weren't even, you know, dramatically performing, but still they could be important. Um, however, uh, we are, le as we were saying before, we are less, um, uh, informed properly about when, when gunpowder was introduced and naft at some point came in fact to identify especially later in the 14th century uh, uh, to gunpowder rather than old petroleum based weapons so you see how terms are flexible and and complicated to to interpret at the same point so uh, the methods we have to understand today how this thing worked um, a bit is for archaeologists to look at ruins of castles and identifying uh, some rests of um, you know of substances substances that might have used for their uh, explosive effect which is also kind of risky but it, it, it's it, it's a way uh, I mean risky in terms of properly heuristic what you can discover factually about that it's just very complicated um, but, um, so as we were saying before, we know gunpowder firecrackers uh, used in China since the mid-11th century, right? And we know that a century afterwards, Chinese may have started properly to, to use um, explosive mines uh, with, with the same uh, technology. Um, in Egypt, uh, fragments of naft grenades, uh, for example, were used to burned down Fustat in 1168 and some of them did contain uh, traces of saltpeter and by the 1230s the Middle East knew the essential ingredient of, of gunpowder widely in the same moment in which explosive iron grenades were used in China. As we were saying before, there were some bamboo rather than metal gun barrels possibly used um, for 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 a few decades, um, and uh, and the interesting aspect of this is, according to Chinese uh, sources, um, many uh, of the uh, the the engineers operating mangonels and cannon-like explosive in China were Muslim. Right, we have uh, an info about this, mostly coming from uh, engineers, mostly coming from uh, Mesopotamia, from Persia, uh, being probably the top military engineers in, in Chinese armies. Uh, in, these are the same years, by the way, of Marco Polo's travels that credits, um, you know, the, the construction of those devices. But Chinese sources state in, in, uh, that, uh, at least in the, the instance of of that of that siege of Xian Yang um, and the um, that were the, the, en the engineers used to, st to to attack to besiege the, uh, the settlement were Iraqis right and uh, in fact the um, the Arab type of counterweight trebuchet was henceforth known in China as Wee Wee Pao or Muslim engine fundamentally um, and 
this uh, surprises you because you would think that the Chinese were ahead in uh, siege uh, warfare technology. Instead, uh, at least the Middle East here was fundamentally uh, at least capable of producing uh, the uh, top technology and just uh, it would implement it, however, uh, we're arguably making less use than, than, than China. I remember that thing we were uh, saying before, that at that point China was a much larger uh, power. It's a bit like the, the France compared to the smaller European states we were saying before. Uh, it's like also the Hellenistic city-states versus the Roman Empire. It, some areas might have implemented better technology, but not having properly the funds uh, the um, the structural capacities to to produce them in a large number, but this does, doesn't mean that it wasn't known um, at the time either, right? Think even Marco Polo at that point he he had, he had, you know that that info was 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 uh, was known at least, and uh, that technology was 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 seen. So um, it's pretty much evident that uh, knowledge information about these things circulated that uh, properly the, uh, the for example the ingredients the the know-how was, was shared right and uh, we know during the battle of Mansur of 1249 when the French crusaders invaded Egypt that the Mamluk uh, army of the last Ayyubid uh, Sultan at least shot um, uh, Kidr Iraqi in uh, Arab, which means uh, Iraqi pot, right, from giant crossbows. Um, and this exploding on impact and possibly containing primitive gunpowder for that matter. So you see how the thing we were saying before, independently from properly from guns, uh, explosive devices might have been used for as regular, you know, as projectiles for regular artillery. Um, as we we're saying before, by the time of of, of the siege of Acre 1291, we're quite certainly sure that explosives were used against Crusader defenses. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the aforementioned Hassan al Rama uh, uh, arrives with the, the good description that we're presenting here by the end of the 13th century. Providing, by the way, his own, r r r the aforementioned recipe for gunpowder that albeit uh, not so clear to, to interpret from the original text, um, presents a, a more effective explosive than the one uh, uh, described by the English chemist Roger Bacon, writing in 1266-68, right? Um, but there was so much else that the Mamluks were employing in parallel. For example, the same Hassan uh, mentions uh, the, uh, you know, you know, Mamluk cavalry and infantry being provided with explosive Savar um, Rik firecrackers that were used to uh, to frighten enemy horses, right? As well as um, so this is interesting as rockets, arrow grenades, right? So grenades properly shot with the, um, like like uh, with an arrow, um, even at sea, rocket propelled torpedoes which skim across the surface of the sea and kites to drop incendiaries on castles or ships right so this tells you how uh, you know you know literally the middle ages is this civilization of of machines and the level of mm, mm, theoretical mm, speculation and practical application uh, has in, in this time in history probably its greatest um, a point of, um, of 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 connection. Um, um, as we we're saying before, the uh, semantics of the word "naft" shifted from uh, petroleum-based weapons to gunpowder-based ones. However, this was uh, in turn superseded uh, by the term "barut," that has the properly identifies gunpowder uh, as such. Um, the uh, the meat fuss would. Um, developed eventually as this. You see here we have a small handmade mortar, right? Um, and that is uh, similar to the the earliest handguns in Europe, uh, with 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 the, with the gun basically held a, a uh, fixed at the uh, at the end of of a long pole, right? Um, and um, as we were saying before, however, it was probably cultural resistance uh, from the Mamluk. 
uh, establishment that until the end of the 14th century would rely mostly in in their artillery uh, on, on trebuchet right and we know eventually that by the the early 15th century um, uh, we know uh, the Indians for example imported handguns from the Middle East so uh, these were still part of a broader production and uh, export and trade system etc um, there is a you know a, there was a parade in Cairo in 1432 where handguns as well as crossbows were carried um, uh, right and yet albeit the Mamluks made this excellent use of fire uh, technology especially at sea and uh, integrated with gunpowder etc um, the uh, the Europeans and the Ottomans would go ahead right so uh, it, it would be interesting to compare properly what what happened there. that tells you how much because we made videos about the uh, about Ottoman artillery and you know that the Ottomans especially in the early modern age were fundamentally at the top of gunpowder technology they were the ones that fundamentally introduced the greatest um, uh, technological innovation until the bayonet, uh, that is the granulation of power to oxygenate better the, the powder and to, to set a blaze uh, all in one shot and increasing the, properly the, the explosive um, capacity. Um, and, um, and the force delivered all in, in one shot to project uh, the, the bullet. Uh, but they would have problems with that too. And um, that cultural problem would be surpassed however in the case of the Ottomans more than any other Muslim power except maybe as we were saying before the Emirate of Granada that however was resized in these centuries and wouldn't have dramatic assets different from the Ottomans that were ever growing um, and but also and especially because the Ottomans were a much more Western power than let's say uh, Persia or the Golden Horde or even Mamluk Egypt. Mamluk Egypt that as you know was something a bit more but even Egypt in general before that a bit more of a statal power compared to um, mostly the, the feudal or quasi feudal powers that existed in the, in the Middle East starting from Persia that is uh, thought to have uh, uh, made a mass to have started using uh, handguns on a, on a regular basis only after the defeat suffered at the hands of the Ottomans at Caldiran that instead shows a, a very interesting um, uh, employment of, of firearms from, from the Turkish side um, and the same can be said for, for the Golden Horde I mean there was this prejudice in, in the chivalric mentality that was a bit part of the Turks of the Mongols that came from the steppe from mostly fixated with uh, with their equestrian skills in a world that was very unstable especially after the destruction of the caliphate of Baghdad at the end of the Mongols the, the, the Middle East turned into something much more of like a, a great frontier right and of which a bit the just the Ottomans and the Mamluks the latter of which actually influenced the early a lot in terms of model of, of military power that's often uh, overlooked how much Egypt impacted properly also uh, Ottoman military development because it was the, the largest Muslim power around right and how much this was in contact even notoriously with Venice since since centuries and century um, and so all this makes you see how you know we are in front of a paradox the Mamluks developed basically the best or among the best uh, gunpowder technology but they it takes more time to to make it properly to integrate it in, in the army system was it a weakness not necessarily um, as we were saying before uh, the, the the military effectiveness of the people is not measured on how much technology it has but rather how much um, how it employs strategically its its force right and um, also the collapse of the Mamluk Sultanate at the end of the Ottomans is not to be connected with uh, with uh, less use of, of artillery at least you know there is there's probably likely something to it too but it has uh, an explanation must be searched in the political and social structure of of Mamluk Egypt that was living seemingly a crisis 
of production, of stagnation, uh, with an evergreen, you know, enlarging bureaucracy, etc. And that uh, instead of rampant power like the Ottoman one, was much more military forged properly in its development, was um, would, would take over. Um, so, all right, we will keep talking about this stuff, which is is fascinating indeed. Uh, but as you know, I, I care very much for this. Uh, not not to fall into technologistic prejudices that I think it's one of the greatest diseases. It's the I, it's what I call the eternal delusion. Because uh, it's as if people have always fell back in, into it in a way or another. Uh, that uh, that it, and always remembered this technology by itself is nothing. Doctrine is everything. Right? For better for worse. Right. Uh, so all right, for today, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.